I'll take it away. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, thank you. So uh, very nice talk, by the way, uh, the previous speaker. Appreciate that. And uh, my name is Boncho Bonef. Hello, everyone. I'm grateful to share some results, some new results uh, on CAC Nurseback studying comets, and uh, more specifically on near infrared spectroscopy, high resolution uh, on comets. Uh, CAC and NERSPEC have been vitally important in these studies. And the main driver uh, for this work is better understanding of planetary system formation. Because comets retain ices from the midplane, the dense midplane regions, the central regions uh, of the Proto solar disk. So comets provide us uh, an accessible window to the mid-plane mid chemistry of a forming protoplanetary disk. Uh, mid-planes are the hardest regions to probe because they're opaque uh, in forming extrasolar planetary systems. Because of this connection between comet composition and protosolar midplane, uh, this chemistry, there has been an increased synergy, actually a rapidly increasing synergy between compositional studies of comets and astrochemical models for uh, forming planetary systems. And uh, there have been a number of uh, new results providing uh, insights uh, that come from ground-based observations, many of them uh, done with CAC NERSPEC uh, about the early stages of our solar system, uh, including, but not limited to, uh, the fact that the interstellar signatures in comets, uh, those that go back to the pre-solar cloud, are not erased in the abundances that we measure uh, with observations like the one I will be de describe, but also very interesting insight about large scale um, transport processes in the disk like radio mixing as shown here or vertical mixing uh, between the mid plane and uh, other regions in the disk. And I would recommend the, uh, the new paper of Karen Willacy uh, show some interesting insights and direction of future work on that. But of course, there is a challenge, a very significant challenge, and this is to separate the cosmogonic heritage from effects of post-formative processes, from effects of uh, post-formative evolution in our measured abundances. And these are really uh, the, main, the main things that uh, we are trying to solve, our motivation and our challenges in doing such studies. So in this context, here is our target, close and personal, uh, Comet 67P, Churum of Gerasimenko, the best studied comet to date, yet there are important questions um, remaining. Uh, it was a target uh, of a spacecraft mission, the Rosetta mission. Uh, the uh, spacecraft reached the comet when it was on the inbound part of its orbit uh, and studied the comet both with an orbiter and a lander as it approached perihelion, passed perihelion, and then in the outbound, outbound. And uh, it's enormous amount of incredibly important information. Um, as a matter of fact, this summer, I, I taught the entire class just about the Rosetta mission, but importantly, new results continue to be published. Uh, interpretations continue to evolve. And this comet 67P is also of interest, uh, continues to be as a possible target 
uh, for NASA sample return. But this is, of course, missions which bring enormous detail, invaluable detail on very few selected targets. And understanding, which comes from missions on very few selected targets, needs to be bridged with what we learn from remote sensing with telescopes like Keck, NASA RTF, and others. And it is astronomical remote sensing which studies comets as a population, as I would say diverse populations as objects with uh, different properties. And there is a missing link. There is a missing link in connecting the insights from mission and the insights of remote sensing. This comet, the best studied comet, has never been studied in detail from the ground, from ground-based observations in what we call native volatiles or parent volatiles or primary volatiles. So these are volatiles considered to be stored as ISIS, originally as ISIS in cometary nuclei. Previous apparitions, including during the missions, the mission were not favorable for such studies. And such studies are critically important as a bridge between astronomical remote sensing and mission results. But the 2021 operation was really, really good and it presented the last opportunity at least until the mid uh, 2030s. So these were timely observations, time sensitive observations. And we had um, a campaign including CAC, which was selected to perform the most sensitive studies and observe the comet at uh, two separate time frames. The first one was near peak activity and a little bit afterwards. So let me introduce you in uh, the spectra uh, we have taken. This is a typical near infrared spectrum. Uh, you can see in color the infrared continuum from micron sized dust. And about the continuum, uh, you can see emission lines which here are spectral signature of water. Emission model components are showed below the measured spectrum and um, a little bit of dissociatively excited OH. Uh, these water lines were actually uh, one of the first spectral feature we saw in the data during uh, the actual observations. Of course, we would like to sample the chemistry. This is a spectrum with lower gas to continuum ratio and the highlight is spectral signatures of HCN, uh, an important volatile. And when you see these other molecules, um, acetylene, ammonia, they're also very important. Uh, the models here uh, imply low abundances. These are actually not secure detections, but importantly, the sensitivity of CAC and the upgraded NERSPEC provided incredibly sensitive constraints on their abundances. So we learn a lot, even when we don't have a secure detection. It is important to sample molecules from different chemical groupings. Um, and uh, the highlight of this spectrum aligns of ethane, Symmetric hydrocarbon, which similarly to acetylene I showed in the previous slide, it can be sensed only at uh, in the infrared uh, wavelength. So the infrared is a unique window to sense symmetric hydrocarbons. So uh, what do we learn uh, from these spectra? Before I go there, I want to just give you a glimpse of another important piece of information. In addition to the spectral information, the fact that NERSPEC has a long slit is incredibly valuable. And this is a long slit distribution of uh, continuum emission and of water gas emission um, extended towards the sun. 
because most of the outgassing uh, comes in the sunlit hemisphere. Uh, but what I want to point out is that quantitative analysis of this spatial, these spatial distributions is critically important for deriving accurate abundances. So we have these nice spectral spatial uh, measurements, and we have at least two directions to interpret the results. One is synergy with Rosetta, and the other is synergy with the other remote sensing studies. As I mentioned earlier, these observations are abridged between both. So here is one example. What I show here is relative abundance with respect to water, water being 100%. So this is percent abundance relative to water. And uh, this is Rosetta measurement. Of course, the mission did measurements uh, throughout, uh, throughout its duration. Uh, this abundance is uh, done during peak activity, similar to our observation. And it's also current estimate of the bulk nucleus abundance. Uh, of the ISIS. But what's interesting is that Rosetta had another investigation, um, Miro, and uh, the two abundances are very different, retrieved from different Rosetta experiments, which is, uh, of course, not a surprise since uh, intercalibration between different experiences is state of the art challenge. And here, our uh, measurements at CAC. Uh, they're shown as upper limit uh, and whether these are uh, upper limit or marginal detections as we are trying to understand now, this is actually less significant because the abundance is very well constrained. And now we need to understand why it's in better agreement with the mass spectrometry measurements uh, than with Miro. Is it the methanol abundance? Is it the water abundance? Is it some type of temporal variability because we observe at uh, a different apparition? And then you have measurements in other comets. I show here a subset of measurements. Uh, there are many more, some with larger abundances, some with similar, but again, the idea is to go in this direction and in this direction uh, in terms of our interpretation. And uh, real quick, another example, we can do this with all uh, uh, detected volatiles. Uh, here we have HCN, uh, another interesting molecule, and this is the CAC measurements in fairly good agreement. And then that measurement uh, needs to be reconciled with the variability we see from comet to comet. These are different comets. Uh, all of them, by the way, like 67P dynamically linked to the scattered Kuiper disk, and of course with the Rosetta results. And I can continue uh, with this, but the bottom line is we have a database of ground-based measurements for native volatiles, which is a bridge between the evolving and the numerous, very variable Rosetta findings and the ground measurements, ground-based studies in comets, uh, comets, it as a population. And last but not least, I want to emphasize there has been a large team with each of these people I show here contributing to the investigation. Uh, Greg Dopman, Mike DeSanti, Ronald Verver, Hideo Kavikita, and Neil Russo were instrumental in the observations. Um, and uh, thank you very much for the meeting organizers and everybody who helped with this work. So I will go back with the main conclusion. Uh, thank you and open for questions if there is time. Um, I have a question, which is, um, how long can you observe comments like this from tech? We literally had two, um, two observing nights. Uh, and uh, 
the main reason is first is sensitivity. 67P was not particularly bright comet in terms of infrared line brightness. So we had to very judiciously uh, determine when to observe the comet. And of course, the allocation for solar system uh, studies uh, at Keck is limited. Uh, we had one observing prog program approved to observe near maximum productivity, near peak gas productivity, and that was through Noir lab. And the second, the second observing program was to the Subaru Keck uh, exchange program with Hideo Kawakita as principal investigators to observe a slightly different uh, time. But the value in CAC is not the temporal coverage. The value in CAC is to have the most sensitive study, those which you cannot do with other telescopes. And then to use efficiently all the resources, we had a complementary, equally important program with IRTF, in which we observe only the brightest emission, but we could observe over a longer uh, period of time, uh, more than a month, to look for uh, temporal variability uh, in the comet. And also, this comet has season and to, to, to search for seasonal effects. Great, thanks. Other questions? All right, if there's no more other questions, let's thank our speaker again.